There are over 600 muscles in the human body and they have three main functions. The production of heat, maintaining a balanced posture and, most importantly for athletes, movement. There are many muscles in the human body, such as the cardiac muscle, that can be described as involuntary, meaning they contract outside of our conscious control. However, the majority of the muscles in the human body are classified as voluntary because we control them. These are the skeletal muscles that attach to bones and move the skeleton. While in combination muscles can produce complex movements, each individual muscle is only capable of two things, contraction and relaxation. To understand muscular contraction, we'll need to examine the specialized cell structure of muscles. A muscle consists of bundles of muscle fibers, and these fibers are made up of smaller units called myofibrils. A myofibril is a series of filaments joined end to end. When stimulated, the filament slides into itself, shortening the length. When thousands of filaments shorten simultaneously, they produce the powerful contraction of the muscle. When the stimulus is removed, the filament slides out again to its original length, relaxing the muscle. The stimulus to contract is transmitted from the brain to the muscle by the nervous system in the form of an electrical impulse. These impulses are sent by nerve cells called motor neurons. One motor neuron doesn't stimulate the whole muscle, but only a number of fibers within that muscle. The motor neuron and the fibers it stimulates is called a motor unit. The smaller muscles of the body, like those in the eyes or the fingers, contain relatively few motor units, each controlling a small number of muscle fibers. This allows delicate and accurate movements to be made. The larger muscles, like the hamstrings, contain many motor units, each controlling a large number of muscle fibers. If the force required from a muscle is small, only a few individual motor units are stimulated. This allows the other motor units to be held in reserve. If a powerful effort is needed, all the available motor units will be stimulated simultaneously. But this powerful contraction can only be held for a short time because the immediately available energy supplies will become exhausted. Skeletal muscles are made up of fast-twitch fibers and slow-twitch fibers. Fast-twitch fibers contract very rapidly and are therefore useful for sports requiring sudden, explosive movements. Slow-twitch fibers contract more slowly but for a longer period and are therefore useful for sports requiring endurance. Each individual has a genetically determined ratio of fast twitch and slow twitch fibers and this ratio cannot be significantly changed by training. The average person has a ratio of about 40% fast twitch fibers to 60% slow twitch fibers but there are many exceptions. For example an elite sprinter may have a ratio of almost 80% fast twitch to 20% slow twitch fibers whereas an elite marathon runner may have the reverse, 20% fast twitch to 80% slow twitch fibers. However, most sports require a more even combination of fast and slow twitch fibers. The force of muscular contraction is transmitted to the bones by tendons. Muscle fibers taper into a tendon, which is very strong and will stretch by about 5%. This slight stretching acts as a shock absorber, protecting the muscles and bones against impacts or other excessive forces. For movement to occur, a muscle must cross a joint between two bones and be attached to these two bones. The point at which the muscle is attached to the moving bone is called the insertion of the muscle. And the point at which the muscle is attached to the non-moving bone is known as the origin of the muscle. 
When the muscles of a limb contract, they pull on the skeletal bones, which are arranged as a hinged system of levers, and the limb moves. Flexion is the movement that describes the angle of the joint being decreased, such as bending movements. Extension is the movement that describes the angle of the joint being increased, such as straightening movements. Muscles can only exert a pulling force through contraction. Muscles cannot push. Once flexed, a limb would remain flexed unless an opposing force was applied. The force that produces the straightening or extension of the limb is supplied by another muscle pulling on the other side of the bone through a separate leverage system. The muscle that directly causes movement through contraction is called the agonist. In this example of the flexion of the arm, the agonist is the biceps, which shortens. In order for arm flexion to occur, the triceps muscle must lengthen. This muscle is called the antagonist because its action is opposite to the agonist. When the arm is extended, the roles are reversed. The triceps is the agonist and shortens. The biceps is the antagonist and lengthens. Precise control of the range and speed of movement is achieved by a constantly adjusted balance between the pull exerted by an agonist and the opposing force of the antagonist. This occurs throughout the body during physical activity. We've already mentioned flexion and extension, but there are many other types of movement. Of particular relevance to athletes are abduction, adduction and rotation. Abduction is the movement of a body part away from the midline of the body. Adduction is movement of a body part towards the midline of the body. Rotation is when a body part is moved either outwards, lateral rotation, or inwards, medial rotation, around its long axis. The functions and movements of our muscles during physical activity are monitored and controlled by the nervous system. In simple terms, the nervous system can be thought of as a central computer, the brain, connected to all parts of the body by wiring. Information is gathered both inside and on the surface of the body by specialized sensor nerves. This information is transmitted as electrical impulses to the brain and decisions, most of them unconscious, are made. The appropriate commands are then transmitted back to the various body systems through the spinal cord. This is why a common cause of permanent paralysis of the limbs is damage to the spinal cord.